to the second panel discussion of the Development Discussion Days 2022. My name is uh, Dr. Susanne Neubert, or Susanne Neubert, <laughs> Director of the Center for Rural Development of the Humboldt University at, um, zu Berlin. For 21, uh, for 21 years, the Center for Rural Development um, has organized the Development Discussion Days in close uh, cooperation with the Heinrich Böll Foundation. This year, for the first time, the Development Discussion Days take place in a hybrid uh, format. For the second panel titled, Sharing the Cake, Rethinking Inequality in Times of the COVID-19 Pandemic, we welcome both an online and a live audience here in the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Berlin. I would like to welcome all the panelists from BMZ and NGOs joining us both digitally and on stage. Thank you very much that you are here. You will be um, welcomed and uh, presented afterwards by the moderators. And um, I would like to thank um, the team for organizing and moderating the panel. This is Carmen Steinmetz. Who are you? Ah. Tina Walter. Ah, okay. Svenja Sender. Felix Bornheim. Simon Meister. Rabia Zweig. Ah, okay. And uh, David Pyka. Thank you very much. We also thank the simultaneous uh, translators who will translate the panel discussion into th German. Hello. Now I would like to turn over to the, the floor over to the team. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Susanne. <laughs> we would also like to welcome you to the second panel discussion of the Development Policy Discussion Days 2022. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, online via Zoom and here live at the Heinrich Böll Foundation. This is my colleague Simon Meister. My name is Carmen Steinmans and we are going to guide you through the first half of today's event with the title Sharing the Global Cake, Rethinking Global Inequality in the Wake of the COVID-19 Pandemic. A warm welcome to our panelists. Um, as the title might already give away, we'll be spending the next three and a half hours um, talking about the issue of global inequality. But first, um, let me give you a brief overview of the afternoon's agenda. Uh, we will start off by introducing our panelists um, and then show a video um, about the, that will show the definition of inequality and also um, talk us through the consequences of um, inequality. This will, be then be, this will then be followed by an introductory comment um, of each and every panelist on the issue of um, inequality reduction. Then we'll jump into the first round of discussion on the issue of um, global redistribution and the potential role that in international cooperation can play in redistribution. Thereupon, we will allow question and answers um, to happen before going to the coffee break at around 4.30. After the 30-minute break, our colleagues Svenja Zender and David Püga will take over. They will kick off the second half of today's event with a discussion on the responsibility of the global north and on how policy co coherence could contribute to reducing global inequalities. This will be followed by a second video input and a more specific discussion surrounding the distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine. The panel discussion will be complemented by another round of questions from our audience, after which we will close today's event at 6.30. Before we continue, uh, I would like to inform the audience um, that this session is being recorded and the video of it will potentially be uploaded to the homepage of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Then I also have a comment to the online audience joining us. Um, if you feel like having questions for the question and answer sessions uh, later on, um, you can write your questions in Zoom in the Q&A section. You can see the symbol here on the slides. Um, if you write 
a question there, uh, please also indicate to whom your question is directed. Um, this will then uh, allow us to uh, direct the question to the proper person. Um, if the rest of the audience sees a question that they appreciate, uh, they, they can feel free to like that question so that we can see uh, what questions are spe specifically liked by the audience. Um, our question moderator, Felix, uh, will then be so kind as to verbalize these questions and direct them to the panel. Now we will proceed to the introduction of the panelists. Um, so I would like to ask Carmen, who is sitting with us. Yeah, the first person we would like to welcome on our panel is joining us from Nairobi, Kenya. Ms. Joki Jehu is an African feminist, an activist for justice and dignity, and the co-founder and executive director of the Daughters of Mumbi Global Resource Center, an independent women's and food rights network in Kenya. She is a board member of the Urgent Action Fund Africa and of Natural Justice, as well as a longtime member of the Green Belt Movement of Kenya. Ms. Jehu studied women and third world studies at the William Smith College in Geneva, New York, and development communications at Cornell University. Her experience as an activist working with grassroots movements will most certainly contribute to a fruitful debate. We warmly welcome you to our panel, Ms. Jehu. Next. Um, I don't know if you can see me. Oh. <laughs> yes, we can. Um, okay. Except I can't see myself, so I am uh, on my um, my my phone. But thank you, and I'm glad to be part of this conversation today. Um, I think in terms of what I was asked to do, which was to give a, an opening statement, is to say um, that... Ms. Jehu, we would like to first uh, conclude the introduction of the other panelists, and then we'll come to okay. the introductory statements. Okay. It will be. Great. But okay. uh, we're looking forward to it, don't worry. <laughs> uh, next to Ms. Jehu is sitting uh, Dr. Jürgen Sattler. He's development and macroeconomist with more than 30 years of international experience. Uh, that's true, right? <laughs> <laughs> Correct. It's a two and a half maximum. Uh, you see that I'm probably... <laughs> <laughs> and then we have something in common already. Um, uh, he's been working in the BMZ in various positions since uh, 1986, <laughs> uh, where he currently is Director General for Multilateral and European Policy. Between 2017 and 2020, he served as Executive Director at the World Bank, representing Germany. Prior experiences uh, include stations at the European Commission as well as at the Dresdner Bank. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of Gießen. Um, his German development perspective will enrich the debate, um, and we're delighted to have you here with us on the panel, Mr. Sattler. Next on our panel is Dr. Andreas Wolf. He is a global health advocate at Medico International. He holds a degree in medicine and a doctoral degree from the Free University of Berlin. He's a board member of the German Association of Democratic Doctors and a member of the steering committee of the Geneva Global Health Hub, a civil society network focusing on global health governance, being the voice of civil society at the WHO. Dr. Wolf has um, a thematic focus on inequalities and health, as well as the access to health services and essential medicines. His expertise in this field will be particularly valuable in the latter part of the discussion on COVID-19. A warm welcome to the panel today. Last but not least, uh, joining us from Brussels, I believe, is Borja Arroé. He is Senior Policy and Advocacy Advisor at Concord Europe, where he is mainly working on inequality and sustainable development. By background, he's a political scientist with a focus on European affairs, social policy and sustainable development. After university, his path led him to Brussels, more specifically to the European Social Observatory, the European Commission, and then to the Age Platform Europe, where he led a task force on aging with dignity. 
His European perspective on inequality will provide an interesting angle to this discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Arrué, for being with us. At the Heinrich Böll Foundation and the Center for Rural Development, we value diversity in terms of genders and perspectives from different walks of life. In the preparation leading up to this event, uh, we were committed to having a very diverse panel, uh, which did not fully fulfill, but um, this is why we do encourage questions from our audience to include a wider range of viewpoints. We are nevertheless looking forward to a very fruitful discussion. To start up with a common understanding of the term global inequality, we have prepared a short introductory video and would like kindly ask the um, technicians to play this now. Rising and high levels of inequality are one of the major long-term challenges for humankind. While the climate crisis as another global challenge is slowly getting the attention it deserves, reducing inequalities is still largely neglected as a structural issue. Nearly half of humanity lives in poverty, while the wealth of the richest 2,755 individuals has grown by over 60% to 13.8 trillion US dollars over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. The richest 10% hold 76% of global wealth. On a national level, inequalities threaten social cohesion, the functioning of democracies and economic growth. On a global scale, inequality jeopardizes poverty reduction and overall well-being for all. As a multidimensional phenomenon, it stifles ecological, social, economic and other dimensions of development. Not just in the global south. Inequality is deeply interwoven with the challenge of mitigating and adapting to climate change. Societies with high levels of inequality struggle to implement effective and sustainable adaptation measures. Unequal access to education and healthcare is a severe obstacle for social development, especially for the most vulnerable and marginalized groups like women and girls. And income inequality is perhaps the most commonly measured facet of inequality. It is often considered a proxy for other inequalities. Vulnerable and marginalized groups around the globe are especially affected by the nexus of inequality as a structural factor and the associated social, psychological, and health problems. All of this makes tackling inequalities as a structural issue a necessity. Just to be clear, tackling inequalities does not mean establishing equality in all regards. A certain level of inequality is sometimes considered necessary for the functioning of a society. But inequality at such extreme levels is most certainly harmful on its own. Inequality describes the distribution of outcomes, such as income, wealth or land, as well as the access to opportunities through relevant resources across an entire population. Inequality is an inherently relative measure. Instead of zooming in on the so-called poor, the inequality approach allows us to see a bigger picture. If we want to tackle inequality, we must zoom out to see the lower end as well as the upper end of any given distribution. Inequalities can be measured within countries, between them or globally. Inequalities within countries consider distribution or access among one country's population. Inequalities between countries can be understood as a comparison of countries based on national averages of GDP or other indices. Global inequalities encompass both within and between country inequalities and take the population of the entire world as one reference group, regardless of national borders. Inequalities can be depicted vertically or horizontally. 
While vertical inequality describes the inequality between individuals or households, horizontal inequality presents differences between different societal groups which are characterized by inherent factors like gender, disability, age, geographic location, ethnicity, sexual orientation, religion, etc. Also, it is important to note that individuals are often exposed to multiple inequalities at the same time, so-called intersecting inequalities. In today's panel discussion, we would like to focus on vertical inequality on a global scale. International cooperation has always focused on particular dimensions of inequality. However, the United Nations 2030 Agenda is the first international development framework that explicitly addresses inequality as a central issue. SDG 10 explicitly aims at reducing inequality within and among countries, thus acknowledging inequality as a structural issue. Furthermore, inequality is connected to one of the leading principles of the agenda. Leave no one behind. But even apart from these designated aspects, inequality in all its forms is a cross-cutting issue that runs through the entire agenda. This gives international cooperation a new mandate for reducing inequalities within and between countries. In practice, however, most interventions aim at the reduction of poverty and fail to address the extreme concentration of power, influence and wealth at the other end. Global inequalities are hardly addressed. By setting this focus, it becomes apparent that tackling inequalities is not self-evident and always a political choice. Hopefully, I hope that the video has given you a better idea of what we're going to be talking about. Um, and let me quickly summarize three main points that were mentioned in the video so that everyone's on the same page as well. First, um, inequality is a political choice. Second, when talking about inequality, it is insufficient to merely focus on poverty reduction. And thirdly, beyond focusing on within and between country inequalities, looking at global inequalities also offers interesting insights. Before we, before we now start with the first block of the discussions, we would like to give our panelists the opportunity to make introductory comments. The first person we would like to ask is Mr. Arue. What are the major challenges in fighting global inequality? Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm sorry not to be with you there face-to-face uh, -face physically in the in the room. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be in, in Berlin, but not possible for me this time. Uh, so thanks for giving the opportunity to join you online from, from Brussels. Um, maybe I can introduce a little bit the organization I work for so that you have an overview of where my inputs will be coming from. Uh, so I'm working for Concord uh, Europe, uh, which is uh, the confederation of uh, development and relief NGOs in Europe. So we have in the network 28, uh, we, which, we call, which we call national platforms, so coalitions of uh, NGOs in each of the uh, 27 countries of the European Union, also the United Kingdom, and also 25 uh, networks of NGOs uh, in the field of sustainable development, uh, development in general, and relief as well. Um, for us, inequalities has been always an important topic, uh, but we have had a specific working group working on inequalities for the past two years and a half. So we have uh, integrated in our own structures and ways of working the fact that inequalities, as the video uh, pr properly presented, that inequalities are a structural factor that we have to address in international cooperation and that poverty is only one picture of addressing inequalities more, more widely.
We hope that you've had a nice break and would like to welcome you back to our second part of the panel discussion. As you will have noticed, the setting has changed a bit and for the remainder of the time, David Puka and I, Svenja Sender, will be moderating. I would like to quickly recap the first part of our event. In the beginning, we received a short input on the structural dimensions of inequality from the SLE team. Afterwards, our panelists discussed how global inequalities could be addressed and which role international cooperation can or should play in this. In the second half of our panel discussion, we would like to look at the impact of the Global North actions on global inequalities and address the topic of responsibility in light of these long-distance effects or Fernwirkungen in German. Afterwards, we will introduce the main example of global inequality, which we would like to talk about today, which is the restricted access to COVID-19 vaccines in the Global South. There will be two discussions amongst our panelists, an input and another question session with the audience. Again, those who are joining online can ask questions via the Zoom function and the audience here at HBS will be able to ask questions in person later. Now we will start with the first discussion and I hand over to David. Yes. Thank you, Svenja, and also a warm welcome from my side. Um, so I would like to address the first question of this discussion block to uh, Ms. Uh, Jehu. Um, given that today's globalized world is highly interconnected and interdependent, does the global north, in your opinion, have a responsibility to consider in which way its actions impact upon the global south? Yes, um, I think the question is whether the impact is negative or positive. Um, if COVID-19 has taught us anything, it has taught us that we are all connected um, and that we, there are ways in which our destinies and our realities, um, for better or for, for worse, are connected and um, can very quickly um, and very immediately impact each other. So what, uh, whether it is policies, whether it is um, uh, diseases, uh, whether it is trade, all of those things um, are connect us. Um, and then there's also, of course, the, uh, the history you know, of, of colonialism, the history of uh, post-colonial relations, you know, uh, where many people, depending on who colonized their country, um, are going, uh, have been educated, um, uh, existing trade relations and other kinds of relationships are therefore closer and, uh, and more immediate. So um, that interconnectedness, uh, both negative and positive, is definitely there. Uh, we are intertwined, and um, and lastly, the thing that I want to point out that uh, really brings this to home is a climate crisis. The 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 extreme, uh, whether it is the extreme uh, extremities of weather um, and the impact, and then uh, sort of the cascading or the ripples that come out of from there, from uh, humanitarian crisis, from uh, to immigrant. Uh, uh, immigration um, uh, effects and, 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 and policies that then uh, countries that are receiving immigrants uh, enact. So we are all very, uh, very connected in that way. Thank you. And uh, I would like to address the next question to Mr. Wolf. Um, as a medical expert, how are health systems negatively affected by actions taken elsewhere? Yeah, no, of course they do. They do. The, um, I think the, the, the most serious uh, debates that we had at the moment and which are still ongoing at the moment are the question of, of uh, solidarity model in solving global health crisis or not. And it is, uh, as we said, it's a question also of redistribution. And if we really take it serious to say um, if we are all in, in threatened by a common goal, 
are we willing to really share the resources that are available, to make them available for all? And uh, so redistribution of, of knowledge and access to, to, um, to the means to overcome health crisis means also to say, okay, we cannot just decide for us alone. And this is what happened. And I, I would say this is what is impacting the, the debate of, uh, of today's global, global policies very strongly that, that, people, that um, countries in the global south felt that at this particular moment of scarce resources, starting from masks, starting not just from vaccines, but also from the, um, the, the tests, the diagnostic tests, um, and then the vaccines has shown that that if it comes to comes to such crises, is every country is fighting for itself, even if the um, on the the global let's say conference level um, these terms like global public goods are evoked, but but then in practice everybody is scrambling for its own resources, and then the the ones with the deeper pockets, the ones with the bigger resources get get the most out of it. And th this kind of, of, uh, of betrayal, when you would use a strong word to say betrayal in, in such a situation, I think this will also give us, give us a quite, a, quite a time to really say, okay, is this, uh, what, how, how can we really become, um, how, how can we really shape a global response in a future pandemic that is overcoming these kind of <clears throat> these kind of egoistic tendencies that is in national politics always so yeah maybe uh, the global response that's a good word to uh, bring mr Tatler into the discussion um, since uh, today's inequalities partly go back on uh, reach back to colonial times, we have heard about that in uh, the uh, previous event today, um, is considering um, long distance effects in German Fernwirkungen uh, also a matter of uh, historic responsibility, our res historic responsibility. I do not uh, know if I really understood well the, the question. You want to say uh, if these uh, more structures, uh, which is uh, which are perhaps still uh, prevailing from uh, former times, from colonialism, if they are still playing a role now, or yes, yes, um, yes of, of course. I mean. Of course, they play a role. There's a kind of path dependency in, in all what you are doing. So it's uh, it's still there in a way. Um, and uh, perhaps nowadays one, one feature is that, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a kind of power uh, imbalance. Uh, of course, the, the more wealthy countries, they have more power. Um, they have more weight, uh, they can use institutions, also international institutions, uh, um, better than, than poor countries. Uh, so we have this situation. Uh, and um, therefore, um, when we talk about problems in developing countries, it's very much about, you know, we are helping. We are helping those countries. And this gives an, an imbalance, uh, but it's difficult to, to get out of it uh, because uh, um, a kind of unconditional help is perhaps not the solution. But uh, on the other hand, to kind of, uh, uh, to, to kind of dictate uh, countries what they have to do is also not a solution. So you have to, to find a, a, a way around. And perhaps one approach is what I just said uh, before the break, uh, to, um, to see where countries, so partner countries, want to, to move into the direction we also share. So there's a kind of alignment of interests and then go together. 
because there you share the interests. It's it's you get out a little bit of this helping and uh, patriarchal system, and you go together. You you do a kind of compact, and you have joined uh, uh, objectives, and you work together on those objectives. I think that's that's a possibility, but it's it's not easy. Yeah? <clears throat> If, if I might ask a follow-up question, um, and um, I mean, you mentioned or you talked about countries that show um, active initiative or active uh, commitment to um, go in a like uh, similar direction. Does this then still require conditions? I mean, maybe conditions are then obsolete. Yes. Um I think um, conditions is not the right word, but you would really uh, reach out and see where there is such an alignment uh, of objectives. And uh, then you, you decide to cooperate. But of course, um, there are benchmarks. And the question is always, what do you do if the benchmarks are not met by the other side? So to give you an example, uh, in, in September last year, I uh, have been in, uh, in South Africa with three other uh, country representatives. So the G4, uh, France, um, UK, US, and, and Germany. And we invited also the EU. We went there because the South African government signaled they would like to work with us to accelerate their NDC, so their climate decarbonization program. So we went there and we tried to find a kind of compact. And so we did the first step, which was they said they will implement an accelerated NDC. And we said we will give 8.5 billion in the next years in order to make that happen. What happens uh, is, what? that's a question, what do we do uh, if one of the partners do not come up with their fulfilling the commitment? Then perhaps uh, there is a kind of conditionality. You can call that conditionality. If the commitment is not met, then we would not continue to pay out the funds. Perhaps another question to you, Mr. Arul. Um, as my colleague David mentioned before, we were talking about colonial continuities. Um, do you consider that international cooperation is also a matter of historic responsibility? Um, yes, uh, I would say so, especially because we see that in the relations between Europe and uh, especially Africa, which is for my confederation a key, a key priority, we see that there is still um, a strong, you know, uh, path dependency, as the speaker, as the previous speaker said. Um, I referred earlier to the EU-Africa relations in the framework of the summit, for example, the EU uh, European Union and African Union uh, summit. Uh, clearly, the, all the economic discussions, as I said before, were very much about traditional businesses. And we know that uh, some European uh, companies are uh, very active in Africa uh, with practices that cannot be considered to be sustainable or to be inclusive, and that perpetuates uh, a, a, a way of uh, well, exploiting natural resources in Africa and creating a kind of a dependency on European corporations that uh, clearly is can be seen as being a neo-colonial. Um, as NGOs, we have also our own work to do because, uh, of course, uh, we all belong to that same history. We all come from there. And there is also sometimes paternalistic approaches and neo-colonial approaches in the way that uh, some of us have been have been working for some time and there is real willingness and I can say that because we do work a lot with our own members on decolonizing our own thoughts and our own way of working even as uh, also civil uh, civil society so uh, the neo-colonial if you like uh, thinking is not only about governments it's also about societies and it's also about civil society organizations and uh, creating a new logic of partnerships we have uh, been developing a lot our relations with uh, partners uh, in different regions and talking to them directly and uh, and also helping and supporting uh, partners in other regions to get involved in discussions at European level. For example, we did a lot of work to make sure African uh, African CSOs, uh, civil society organizations, had a say uh, at the last 
uh, European Union African Union uh, Summit, and we are reinforcing these relations with uh, other NGOs as well. There is a key uh, idea uh, and, and objective, uh, which is about localizing uh, official development aid and international cooperation, so making sure that local partners are consulted, that the local realities are part of the way projects and programs are being implemented, and there is local ownership. If we want to uh, apply the principle of me leave no one behind, that involves making sure that those who know best what are the stakes, what are the, the obstacles to full equality and the situations of discrimination in partner countries, that they are involved in the solutions that we are trying to, to find. So, um, so yes, there is a duty from Europe towards other regions, uh, and uh, and that concerns everyone. And uh, and the key to challenge that is uh, making sure that we listen to the voices of those concerned by international cooperation, meaning everyone in in, in partner in partner countries for sure. So yeah, thank you, Mr. Arui. Um, I would like to. Uh, focus a bit more on a topic that um, um, has been uh, raised before, uh, the topic of incoherence. Um, so I would like to address the next uh, two questions to, uh, again, Mr. Zatla and then also um, to Ms. Jehu. Um, there is this paradox that the internal policies of the global north may increase global inequalities by focusing uh, primarily um, on national interest, while development cooperation aims to reduce the symptoms of these inequalities. Um, some might argue that this is a case of incoherence. Uh, how would you respond to, to those people? Um, yes, I mean, that's a little bit uh, the issue we were talking about in the last session, which is about structural change. And of course, it doesn't make sense uh, also from a, from a government perspective or, and from a donor perspective uh, to just to compensate uh, harm, which is done by, by your uh, colleagues uh, sitting in the other department. So therefore, the BMZ is also trying to um, identify um, policies or planned policies by other departments which might have a negative impact on uh, on partner countries and um, so there are many many examples of course we have limited capacity but we look for example at the tax uh, cooperation i gave the example uh, in the last uh, session we are looking at trade um, uh, and for example we're also talking with the other departments on the planned uh, carbon uh, tax, uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism is called, you know. So that's a good thing, but it might have a negative impact uh, on some developing countries because they have to pay high taxes to get their steel, for example, into the union. And uh, therefore we have to discuss, is there a way to design these taxes uh, in order to avoid those negative uh, impacts. So it's it's really an issue. And uh, do the uh, other departments listen to you when you point out incoherences? Uh, <laughs> sometimes. Um, no, but of course, it's, it's usually it's a, a, a battle, because, and that's also justified because, uh, you know, you have different objectives and all the objectives are justified. For example, you want to protect your market, otherwise, you know, the decarbonization will not happen. That's an, a justified objective. But on the other hand, it's also justi justified to make sure that uh, countries like, uh, for example, uh, Serbia would be very, because Mozambique would, would be probably affected. They they do not have this harm. So it's justified, but we have to discuss. And sometimes, you know, I, I uh, would say uh, uh, the my ministry doesn't have a lot of weight in, in these um, conversations. We are not uh, a very, very strong ministry. The strong ones is uh, finance, uh, it's ministry for economy, 
um, and so on. So we really have to make our point, and that's also why we try to focus on the most relevant issues. Yeah, I would like to also ask Mr. Arrua, you were um, talking about political incoherence at the European level before. Um, what do you think are the next steps to ensure that commitments translate into actions? Um, yeah, it's, um, I mean, we, we are aware that this is a difficult area. Um, we just heard, I mean, we know that at the government level, um, governments are not a, a, a monolithic uh, kind of homogeneous block uh, of people thinking the same. And of course, there is a lot of internal discussion uh, for decisions to be made and uh, lobbying sometimes has to happen within their own institution and government. Um, so we praise the efforts of the German Foreign Affairs Ministry in, in pushing in, in the direction of policy coherence. Actually, I just wanted to refer very quickly to the, own as the assessment we made of policy coherence in our study on inequalities, the assessment we got for Germany. So we saw that, for example, Germany hasn't stopped imports of, uh, of uh, products, including raw materials from countries that are not applying transparency standards in the way these um, raw materials are being extracted, for example. Um, we also found that Germany is trading uh, arms with uh, 15 countries in conflict or at risk of conflict uh, with worth over 250,000 euros. And that Germany hasn't uh, passed for now at least any corporate accountability legislation regarding human rights uh, in supply chains. So those are the incoherences we found in, in, German, in German policies. Uh, but incoherences are uh, actually widespread across uh, all uh, EU countries uh, to some to some extent. Um, one of the um, of the solutions uh, or, the, or the steps that we think can make a difference is that at least governments have mechanisms to monitor uh, whether they are being coherent with the achievement of Agenda 2030 and SDGs. So we find that many governments do not actually have any clear mechanism uh, so that they can monitor whether their policies across different departments are coherent with uh, with uh, sustainable development goals so that would be a first step at least we need to know the the reality we need, we need to monitor it um, in the case of germany for example we have found that there is a strong commitment at political level to agenda 2013 30 but then in practice is there actually any clearly established mechanism to ensure policy coherence across different departments we didn't find evidence of that in another report we published in january on policy policy coherence now we are um, expecting or we, we hope that EU countries will be getting more serious on taxation. Uh, we found that among uh, the 30 top uh, corporate tax havens in the world, among those 30 top uh, legislations in terms of being a corporate tax haven, 12 of them are EU, EU countries. So as, uh, as uh, Gnocchi was saying before, uh, corruption or practices that do not correspond to a perception we, ha we may have about uh, ethics. Uh, uh, these practices are very, really, very much widespread in, in, in the EU as well. Um, we are also hoping that uh, countries will be committing further on, uh, on uh, to domestic resource mobilization by joining the Addis Tax Initiative, which is uh, an interesting step in terms of committing to facilitating technical support and technical cooperation uh, with uh, partner countries to improve their capacity to uh, mobilize their own resources. And also we are hoping that something will be moving in the area of uh, financial secrecy, because uh, again, here Europe is among the, the, the top uh, in the world, the top countries with, uh, with, uh, with uh, financial secrecy uh, practices. Um, I would mention also, and I already mentioned it before, that at the European level at the moment there is a new proposal from the European Commission uh, on corporate uh, sustainability due diligence, that's the name, so an obligation for companies to uh, monitor environmental and human rights, uh, uh, respect of environment and human rights across the production chains of, uh, of corporations based in the EU or uh, operating in the, in the EU, so a proposal is out. We know that only five countries in, in the European Union have made some progress in this area. And I just mentioned that Germany has made progress regarding the environment and not really regarding human rights. So now at the European level, uh, there will be a directive so that every country will have to uh, implement in their own, in their own law. Um, the scope at the moment is very limited. So there is still room in the Council of the European Union where all the different countries are represented to make sure this uh, initiative is uh, ambitious enough because we think that ensuring respect for the environment and human rights across the supply chains that spread worldwide 
uh, that's a key contribution that Europe and companies operating in Europe should be making uh, to ensuring uh, yeah, respect on the environment, human rights, and therefore also that we think that would have a positive impact on, on tackling uh, inequalities. And there are some other ideas that can be, can be explored. There were proposals for a wealth uh, tax, a worldwide wealth uh, tax, tax on wealth. Uh, the French economist Thomas Piketty was proposing that. For us, that's an idea that is worth also considering. So working on, on that aspect of also global standard for taxation, that a discussion that was evolving a bit in the pandemic and, uh, and uh, we do not always see progress going very, very far. Uh, even at European level, I mean, there is some discussion about, uh, about the minimum taxation on corporations, and we are still hoping that goes in the proper, proper direction. So some are, so those are some of the ideas uh, that we, we put forward. So yeah, you you raised uh, um, different facets of uh, how to address uh, incoherence, um, and I actually I have to apologize because I skipped my question to uh, Miss uh, Jehu, uh, which I want to do now. <laughs> uh, so are you still with us? Because we cannot see you. Yes, I am. Okay. It's just that the video is affecting okay. audio, and I want to be able to hear. All right. So, uh, uh, Ms. Jiu, I, I would like to ask you, uh, um, what's your view on, on this incoherence and what facet would you maybe more focus on? Um, well, it's a loaded question and, and um, perhaps I am a little bit more cynical, maybe a little bit more blunt. Um, I think Dr. Zatler talked about the the more um, the more powerful ministries, even in the German government, um, and, and 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 I think there is the question of power. Of course, as a feminist, I know that power is a very uh, important currency and uh, uh, and a currency that uh, operates on all levels. Um, but I also think that there is an intentionality um, where governments, maybe that's where the power comes or the, the, the weight in terms of, if you imagine a cabinet meeting where the trade ministry or the finance ministry or the mining ministry is listened to more, uh, more closely than uh, the social services or the gender or the, or, or the sports ministry. Um, I've also been doing this for a really long time. Um, I, I spent most of the late 90s and the early 2000s working in Washington, D.C., belly of the beast, as, as it has been called. And uh, in those corridors of power, when you talk uh, with people from, from actually elected officials to their staff, they will tell you that the, um, the purpose of whether it is USAID or in, 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 as an agency or other kinds of bilateral trade, uh, bilateral aid that the US does has to do with facilitating um, a US business uh, in uh, or creating an environment wherever they are and then an enabling environment for um, uh, US companies to be able to do business. And so, you know, it is not just, it's, it's not that people don't know better. It's not that the trade ministry doesn't know better, or people in the trade ministry don't know better than people who are in the labor ministry about what needs to happen in terms of labor rights and human rights, or what needs to, to happen in terms of um, uh, uh, gender rights or educational health. They do know, uh, but there they, they are different priorities that are weighted um, and, and, and so it, it has this nice name of uh, policy incoherence, but it is, in my view, uh, perhaps cynical, some people may say, very, very intentional. Um, and so when, when debt policy and tax policy and climate policy and policy about you know, social services are, are in, in conflict, so in one hand, uh, uh, a government be, may be saying they support uh, a women's education, they, they, they support girls' education, uh, they support you know, providing water uh, for communities that don't have water. But at the same time, they have policies where their companies are privatizing education, they are privatizing water, 
uh, they're privatizing health, then you have to wonder, uh, you know, is, is it that they don't know what the left hand, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand uh, is doing? And I leave that, I, I, I leave that to you. Um, and, and, and want to end by saying that, you know, in those many years ago when I was in Washington, um, most of the work that we did was focusing on the World Bank and the IMF. And the World Bank, uh, which rankled a lot about uh, being criticized, you know, they had when you wa walked, I don't know if you still do, they still say so, when you walked into the World Bank headquarters, there was a sign that says, we dream of a world without poverty. And so uh, as much as we were criticizing them, then they published a pamphlet that says, you know, 10 things you should know that the, 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 the World Bank does. And it was about environment, it was about education, girls' education, about women's rights, it was about the uh, um, health. There was a whole bunch of, of things. And for each of those things, we then published uh, a counter as the 50 Years is Enough Network that I worked for that said 10 things you should really know about what the World Bank does. And it was about, you know, when what they said, what they did about education or the environment or women's rights or health. We gave examples of them doing the, the exact opposite. So, I, and I don't think that they did not know about the thing that we were pointing out uh, and only knew about the first thing, which is the thing that they were talking about to tout their to, to tout their record. And I think at some point we really do need to be honest with each other about what what is it that um, governments are doing on behalf of their corporations. Thank on behalf you. of their citizens. So because, you know, um, uh, those I'm very who, I'm sorry policies. Um, but looking at the time, we have to continue, unfortunately. Um, May I finish my thought? Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, yes, especially since there are, there are like three or on this panel, there are three men and only one woman. I would hope that I would get a little bit more, more, more time. But anyway, what I'm saying is that I think it is, it is really important and it is uh, incumbent on us to actually be honest about, you know, what is it that makes a trade ministry more powerful than an education ministry and makes a mining industry more powerful than uh, a social service, uh, social service ministry. When you look at the list of people who are meeting in Davos, in almost every country, and there are many countries represented there, you can see the preponderance of finance ministry, mining in ministries and companies, banking ministries, uh, or banking uh, industry, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It is not accidental. They are there to chat and to ensure that a certain agenda gets delivered. And so let's you know, ask these questions, but also ask, ask them with our eyes wide open and ears open to hear some of the, the truths about what is really going on. Um, it, is not, uh, it is not accidental that these things happen. Thank you. Okay, political incoherence, a topic which we could talk about a lot longer. Um, however, we would also like to come to our second discussion, which is about the restricted access to COVID-19 vaccines. And as an introduction, we would like to share a short video with you first. The COVID-19 pandemic affects everybody equally. This idea was often proclaimed in the beginning of 2020, given that a virus cannot discriminate. Two and a half years later, it has been shown that the pandemic is exposing and exploiting inequalities even further. Around 15 million people across the globe have died in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. The unreported number might be much higher. Not all lives were lost directly to the virus. Most of them succumbed to other diseases and injuries due to the overload of health systems. The COVID-19 pandemic is not only a global health issue. The virus has exposed, fed off and increased existing, often intersecting inequalities of wealth, gender, race and other dimensions. Negative impacts include widespread job loss, inadequate or missing labor rights and social protection policies, 
increased gender inequality, domestic violence, widespread school closures affecting children and youth, just to name a few. Many of these issues have affected marginalized groups like black people or indigenous communities, especially people living in poverty disproportionately. Billionaires' fortunes returned to their pre-pandemic heights within just nine months, while the recovery of people living in poverty could take over a decade. If countries addressed the reduction of inequality immediately, poverty would return to pre-crisis levels within just three years. Even though there is no vaccine against inequality, a vaccine against the virus exists since the end of 2020. Phrases like no one is safe until everyone is safe were pleased to global solidarity to prevent a protraction of the crisis. And today? Vaccine inequality, some even speak of vaccine apartheid, still leaves millions of people at risk of severe illness and death. To better understand the current situation, let us have a look at the data. This map shows the number of COVID-19 vaccine doses distributed per 100 people in each country of the world. The dark green implies that the supply situation is adequate and that booster shots are widely available. The light color means that the access to vaccines is severely limited. If we take a closer look at Africa, the second largest continent by size and population, we see that just 15% of the adult population has been fully vaccinated by now. Only 15.9% of the people in low-income countries have received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. Take a look at this graph. The red line stands for low-income countries. The dark blue one for high-income countries. The space in between demonstrates vaccine inequality. Some might argue now that vaccine inequality already is a matter of global attention. Indeed, COVAX, the worldwide initiative to ensure global access to COVID-19 vaccines, distributed its one billionth dose this January. However, this means that COVAX has achieved only half of its target of delivering 2 billion doses by the end of last year. The German pharmaceutical company BioNTech now plans to supply modular mobile factories for the self-sufficient manufacturing of mRNA vaccines to Rwanda, Ghana, Senegal and South Africa. Nevertheless, non-governmental organizations like Oxfam criticize BioNTech's initiative for being implemented too late and for ensuring that vaccine patents remain in the company's control. Instead, they demand the extension of local production capacities. Human Rights Watch and Doctors Without Borders have found that at least 100 companies in countries of the Global South could potentially produce mRNA vaccines against COVID-19. In March of 2022, results from negotiations between India, South Africa, the European Union and the United States of America concerning a temporary patent waiver on COVID-19 vaccines and other pandemic-related technologies and equipment were leaked. These results imply that the Global North continues to systematically undermine a global response to the pandemic. Again, it appears that inequality is a political choice. Okay, we would like to now start into the last discussion on uh, facilitating access to COVID-19 vaccines. And I would like to ask the first question to Mr. Wolf. Um, as we've just heard, there still is a huge gap between the global north, where vaccines are easily available, and the global south, where there are too few vaccines to provide for even a fraction of the population, especially Africa. In your opinion, how could a more equal global distribution of COVID-19 vaccines be brought about? Yeah, I think the, the 
the, the center, this, uh, the central problem has already been mentioned. I think the question is rather, and this also points back to the first part of discussion we had. Um, it is clear that 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 a redistribution just not works when you want to have scarce resources to be redistributed. I think then, of course, these very egoistic mechanisms. Uh, kick in, and it is clear that that every country is responsible for for each uh, um, people first, and then something is left over, and then might it might be redistributed. What was from the beginning a possibility, and this was not, and this not only started with the waiver debate on the patent issues, but it was clear that the knowledge that were um, funded so strongly also by public funds during the first months of the or in the first year of the pandemic until the vaccines were developed should have been followed by an by a, by a clear commitment to share this knowledge uh, globally and equally so to anybody who could make use of it and these there, there were a couple of initiatives the first was the ctap the COVID-19 access technology pool that was uh, suggested by World Health Organization with also support from smaller countries which were not taken up uh, by, by the important players, the actors, European Union, the German government, which would have put much pressure on, on uh, pharmaceutical companies to really uh, think about the this sharing of, of knowledge. And this was not so much about patenting, um, but, but rather saying, okay, we, it's, it's a necessary step to show that, that the, the, um, the also voluntary licensing um, would be a mechanism that might happen much quicker than, um, than the whole debate that then kick, kicked in only in, um, in fall 2020. At the um, at the World Trade Organization, and as we see, has not been resolved yet. One more than one and a half years later. So in that way, it is. It this would have been shown, and then seeing how this could be put into practice would have been would have been a much easier way to show that this is this is indeed something. Uh, we are we are using this particular situation then also to make use of the extraordinary exemption rules that exist at WTO, the World Trade Organization. But more importantly, I, I would think from the beginning it must have been clear there is a mechanism like public return on public investment. So if we as the world community invest so much into developing in, in, in the response to COVID-19 and uh, to then then the results out of the dot needs to be shared publicly. And I think this mechanism, I uh, let's say also the coalition that we worked with uh, were very strongly um, advocating for. And I must say we had quite a long and strong support from, from a big part of civil society, but unfortunately, the um, the powers to be, and this is because it's about sharing of power also, um, the, the traditional thinking about about uh, investing in, in in research and development necessitates also a private a private investment that has to be secured by by intellectual property rules. Um, could not be overcome so much. And, and I think this is where we got stuck uh, in that process. Uh, Ms. Jiu, uh, you, you seem to agree on what have just been said uh, by uh, Mr. Wolf. Uh, would you like to add something? Are you still muted? We cannot hear you. Sorry. Ah, now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Go Thank ahead. you. Um... I, as you were speaking, I was thinking about this report that Oxfam released yesterday at the beginning uh, of um, the World Economic Forum in Davos that showed that um, in the last year, uh, from uh, well, basically two years, from March 2020 to March 2022, um, the world got a freshly one 
freshly minted billionaire every 30 hours. Let that sink in that every 30 hours, a new billionaire was, uh, was born or came about. And at the same time, they're estimating that a million people will fall into extreme poverty every 33 hours. Now, um, they have also uh, in their research noted that uh, of the uh, 573 billionaires who, who people who became first time billionaires, uh, they came about when central bank Central banks around the world injected millions of dollars into the global economy. It was very much about uh, the COVID-19 crisis, fighting uh, um, um, the pandemic. And so it asks um, the question, or it begs the question, um, with all the inequality that we are saying that there is around um, the vaccine and all the death and suffering that has, uh, that has happened, that we've talked about that is in that was in the video and that has been on display and re reported about all over the world. How do you end up getting um, that kind of uh, uh, reality or situation? At the same time, the, the ten wealthiest men on the Forbes billionaire list doubled their wealth um, from seven hundred billion um, to about one point five trillion dollars this in the pandemic, this at a time when um, uh, the, the ILO was estimating that 1.6 billion workers in the informal sector would lo lose their livelihoods. And it shows the obscenity and the outrageousness of the system that exists. That is really, as I was saying before, it's intentionally designed uh, to deliver some to great wealth uh, and comfort and et cetera, and push others behind, not even leave, but push others behind. Um, and we have to really say and uh, over and over and uh, try all of these things that are being said that maybe they're not feasible, taxing wealth, taxing the rich, looking at illicit financial flows, et cetera, et cetera, to see if perhaps they might work in order to stem and to, to fight inequality and extreme poverty. So yeah, hello. Okay. Uh, so I, I think uh, those disparities you are talking about can be also seen in the uh, global distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. So uh, Mr. Zattler, uh just to repeat those very impressive numbers in the year 2022 today, about 2.5, two and a half years after the beginning of the pandemic. Over 70% of adult population in the Global North countries is fully vaccinated, whereas in Africa, only 15% of the adult population has received two doses of vaccine. Why, why is that? Yes, um, I think, um, of course, at the beginning, it was a problem of uh, vaccine availability. And I mean, you all have uh, have been here and and following the de the debate. Uh, uh, I think uh, there was not really enough readiness uh, by developed countries to share uh, vaccines uh, because there was also domestic pressure, uh, of course. Um, and uh, then, at least, there was a kind of um, of joint effort with COVAX and, and, and so on. And um, I mean, we have often seen these situations where we have had a global problem, financial and the financial crisis, and we had to organize collective action in order to solve this global problem. And it's always difficult. It's very difficult because it's we don't have a world government. So one has to agree on something. Um, um, and there, I think at least one has made an effort and set up some structures, but it wasn't uh, good enough. It, 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 in a way, it was too slow, and um, therefore the rollout, the availability of, of vaccines in in the global south was not very good. In the meantime, I 
what I'm hearing is that in many countries it's not so much the bottleneck, uh, the lack of availability, so it's not so much a supply problem. There are now uh, vaccines, but uh, they are not really well um, applied. And you can even see uh, cases like uh, South Africa where um, they managed to, to draw up a, 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 a kind of production facility, but the vaccines uh, produced in this facility cannot be sold um, because they have perhaps some stigma. Uh, people prefer vaccines coming from industrialized countries and because there are other vaccines now on, on the market. So the situation is, is very complex. But of course, I mean, it's quite clear for developed countries, I think uh, they have to recognize that it's in their own interest to get that done. And it will not be the last pandemic. It w there will be many, many more because there are some structural problems behind that. And therefore, we have to uh, all an interest. And also, from a developed country point of view, we have an interest to get that done in a better way next time than it has been done this time. And I have to tell you, I'm not, uh, it's not in my responsibilities within the, the ministry, uh, the global health issues. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, there's another, uh, another uh, director general responsible for that, Dirk Meyer. And, uh, but nevertheless, I mean, that's my, my opinion. And I think it reflects of the, uh, the position of my, uh, my minister. Uh, Mr. Wolf, would you agree on that? Um, no, I think I think there are, of course, always problems are, are multi-dimensional, and it is clear that this is uh, this is also uh, the case in in many countries where it is much difficult to run to roll out uh, vaccination programs. Um, but it was very clear from the beginning that um, was very clear that the, the solutions that on the global level were were conceptualized, like the ACT A, this this uh, accelerator um, to to access to to uh, COVID nineteen technology. Um, that that was the initiative that was a bit like counteracting the CTAP uh, in the beginning was very much. Fo shaped along the existing traditional ways of doing things in a in a um, in an aid in an in an uh, in an uh, humanitarian aid model. So, meaning we have uh, we designed some some um, some particular resource models, uh, basically also focusing on one particular uh, vaccine, the the AstraZeneca vaccine that would then be. Um, would be given to to uh, the biggest uh, vaccine producer in the world, the Indian Serum Institute, and then this this would be seen as the vaccine for the poor countries. And then at the moment when when India needed its own countries, uh, its own vaccines because of the the huge outbreak in uh, in the spring 2021, these resources had dried up for um, the next couple of months and so this also created this um, this problem to really redistribute um, um, these vaccines along the lines that, that that were envisioned and i think but this is this is particularly the problematic because you 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 try to solve problems that are globally in a very in a mechanism that is designed much more along like this also, I, I would say that it's a global um, chain of production that that sees that that is not thinking about a really a redistributive model of of regionally produced vaccines that then can be also used um, regionally. There are some new initiatives now, and the BMZ is funding uh, a few of them, and I think this is this is. Uh, this is very much a, a positive step on it, but the the rules of the game have not changed, um, and this is this is a bit the the critique that we have. That also the the German government and the BMZ think that they that they can solve this situation in an in a very traditional way of thinking 
okay, we are focusing on also some collaborations and we are supporting um, the BioNTech company to to uh, to establish some some business cooperations with with companies in uh, in a handful of countries, but to really keep this or to trying to to push for a rather for a rather distributive model of knowledge and that this is is really something that and shape the economic de the decisions around it like the intellectual property rights that that would give also local manufacturers uh, room for maneuvering economically to produce and and sell their products this this has not happened sufficiently Perhaps one last question to Mr. Arul. Um, how, what has the international community learned from facilitating access to vaccines in this pandemic? What could be done differently in future pandemics? Well, it's difficult to say. I guess uh, the next pandemic will not be exactly the same because now we know what it is and, and, and what it takes. And I suppose the reaction will be quicker, at least when it comes to countries in the, in the north. Um, I think, I mean, we have seen many uh, concerning developments, like, for example, some uh, countries uh, trying now at the moment, so you could think, well, okay, maybe the discussions at the beginning were not that advanced, that's why we, some mistakes were done and some incoherencies were so clear, but we see that incoherencies are actually there, and I'm not sure we are really learning the lesson. For example, at the moment, some countries are trying to uh, including their calculation of official development aid, the donation of uh, excess of vaccines, for example. So uh, this was already approved in, by the OECD uh, at the end of uh, last uh, year that countries can count the excess of vaccines in their calculation of uh, ODA, which has all sorts of uh, problems because uh, that means that for some countries that means a reduction of ODA for other uh, objectives. Uh, it's also not addressing the structural issues that may exist in the healthcare systems. Uh, so it's not an investment that will be helping countries build stronger uh, healthcare systems. And also uh, there is very weak uh, criteria on eligibility of such donations. So sometimes that means that countries will be donating excess vaccines without taking into account the expiration date, for example, or the capacity of the of the receiving country to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to store the vaccines, for example, or redistribute them on and, and use them. So there are all sorts of uh, problems, I think, and, and, and issues that I'm not sure we are there yet in terms of learning, learning the lessons. What we hope is that uh, in the future, uh, when it comes to, uh, to international cooperation and the use of uh, official development aid, more focus will be put, for example, on yeah, spending towards human development and more concretely, healthcare systems. So at the moment, if you look at the level of uh, how much countries are actually giving in terms of uh, like targeting the healthcare systems of uh, partner countries, we see that it's in, in, in German, from Germany in the German ODA, that's 2.80% uh, of the ODA. Uh, and that's more or less the European average for those countries where we found the, the data. Uh, so it's actually a relatively small amount of Part of the ODA that is devoted to that and in general to human human development. So we need more investment and European countries need to support uh, partner countries to make critical investments in their healthcare uh, systems. And also we hope that the EU will be um, requiring pharmaceutical companies to share the knowledge uh, and the technology they have. Uh, and we already heard in the video that there is a bit of you know, discussion in that direction, but probably quite in a very kind of uh, not very open way for now, uh, or not very generous way for now. Uh, I also wanted to um, highlight what uh, what uh, Miss uh, Yehu said before, the Oxfam report on, on how the pandemic has enabled the emergence of new billionaires, and especially very much so in the pharmaceutical sector and also in food and agriculture. Uh, we are witnessing a huge crisis in access to food uh, and that's having such a human human impact. So we are still not witnessing the end of the pandemic and the consequences, and it's difficult to know to what extent we are we, we are learning the lessons. Thank you. So to close our discussion and today, I, we have. Oh, sorry, Miss Jehu, would you like to add something? Yes, 
I just wanted to add to the conversation and say that part of also the inequality that happened around the vaccine and, you know, created even some of the problems that we saw of vaccine hesitancy uh, were around uh, also what was held widely as racist immigration uh, policies. So, for instance, where the U.S., the, the United Kingdom actually donated AstraZeneca vaccine doses to Kenya. And then for people traveling, they had a list of countries that were people were banned or they had to, to sit in uh, quarantine for uh, 10 to 14 days, which was also very expensive. So you had you you had this uh, situation. They gave the vaccine, and then they were saying that those vaccinations, the, the certificate, the vaccine vaccination vaccine certificates were not recognized. Um, never mind that they were actually when you looked at vaccine. If you have seen a vaccine certificate from Kenya versus one from the U.S., which is unwritten, one uh, can then um, ask the question why one was valid, the other one was not. Um, I, uh, Mr. Rue has also talked about this question of almost expired vaccines. So there were vaccine donations that, or doses that were donated. And then when the headlines were that government, southern governments were destroying those doses, there was an outcry, but it was because they had been um, uh, donated uh, when they were almost expired and they were no longer good. And then the last thing that, and I, and I think this has also been mentioned, is that when you get ODA in the form of vaccine doses that also doesn't address the general conditions or the context of uh, health services in a country, then there is something missing in the, in the equation. And uh, referring to our earlier conversation about coherence, even in the pandemic, the IMF still continues to demand that countries uh, put a cap, limit how much money they are putting in their health budgets around infra infrastructure and also personnel. So we have all of these things that are <clears throat> that are playing uh, and policies that are playing uh, playing out um, even as uh, as the pandemic continues to hit and pinch and uh, deliver a lot of suffering for many people in uh, in many countries and communities around the world. Thank you. All right, we will now close our discussion with one last statement from all of our panelists. Uh, we have prepared one question which we would like you to be answered by in one sentence, if possible. <laughs> so um, after the event today, what does rethinking global inequality mean to you? Perhaps uh, Mr. Aruya, would you like to start? Uh, yeah, um, that gives an advantage to other panelists who have a couple of minutes to think about their response, <laughs> not an easy one. Uh, I guess, uh, I mean, we, we, I'm still hopeful that in a way uh, the, the pandemic will stay in our minds and our way of analyzing the reality and interacting with the world. Uh, in the sense that uh, the pandemic revealed that there is a connection between everyone and the planet because public health is something that connects all of us. So I, I am hoping that uh, in a way this lesson is learned and that citizens will be holding their governments more accountable for their action on tackling inequalities. Um, in general, we do see that at the political level, at least there is increasing recognition of the importance of uh, of tackling inequalities. I think that's clear that there is an evolution in the discourse and there is uh, some ideas that seem not to be possible, like rethink thinking of a global minimum level of corporate tax. Those are making their way very slowly, much slower than we thought, but they are still making a bit of a path. Uh, so, so yeah, I don't know how rethinking inequalities worldwide will look like exactly, but I think I'm hoping that uh, we will learn some of these uh, lessons we are discussing discussing today. Uh, and we are doing our part in, in civil society to make sure that inequalities is part of our work, of our analysis, and that we do what we preach, and that inequalities is fully part of the work we are doing and that our own members and NGOs are, are, are doing. So um, that's more or less my response, not very structured, but uh, it's a very challenging question that you asked. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Wolf, would, would you like to continue? So after the event today, what does rethinking global inequality mean to you? 
No, reducing global uh, inequality has, I, I think the COVID-19 pandemic and, and the other crises have seen, have shown, have mobilized a lot of people around this this issue of inequality and, and have seen to a certain extent also the pandemic that, uh, that we are interconnected and we cannot solve problems on our own, and uh, that's as that's I still think, even if I pointed out the the shortcomings of the responses, um, and and we are particularly critical of the the work of also our own government in this regard. Um, we still think that the the um, the moment to to um, to see that this cannot continue, and this is as Mr. Sackler said in the beginning. Um, to go back to a time in the beginning, like in the beginning of the 20th century, so when inequality was so extreme, um, this also mobilized a movement of people, the, the workers' movement in that time, also to, to demand not just a fair share, but also to, to see, um, to demand the change of the, the rule of the games. And I think this... This is something that um, that I'm quite optimistic that this happens uh, in the near future, and of course it must happen in the near future. Mr. Zettler, would you like to continue? What is your yes. opinion? Uh, so perhaps uh, continuing uh, what has been said, inequality has the same level more or less than at the beginning of last century. What happened at the beginning of last century? Um, we have seen a lots of um, political unrest and fascism is, uh, is in a way um, linked to that. We have many features which are, um, which are very close to what we have uh, had in the 20s last year. For example, also the level of indebtedness. And, uh, and this can very easily turn into political economy situation which are very problematic. And that's the first point. The second one, the issue is so big, uh, I don't have uh, the kind of catch uh, uh, 66 answer. Um, but um, uh, you have to slice it up. And uh, one issue is um, these crises we have seen, the pandemic, um, the financial crisis, uh, the uh, war, they have a, a very big impact on the poor and on inequality. And these crises are here to stay. It's, in a way, um, the dysfunctioning of our economic system which is producing this, these crises. I could further explain, but you want to have one sentence. So they are here to stay. And one issue there is to find a more systematic response to those crises. And we can't you know, just react to those crises. Uh, for example, Afghanistan uh, uh, sending uh, huge amounts of food aid or now the countries affected by the food uh, situation sending food aid. You know, these emergency uh, uh, um, actions, uh, they are too costly and they do not have a structural impact. Why not really focusing on issues which are structural? For example, uh, adaptable social safety nets, that's a concept which is there, very good experience in Latin America, in some African countries, as systems which are part of the policies of the countries, there if we focus on these kind of issues and once the crisis hits, we can use those structures to, to channel funds into the system with a structural impact and not only to, to feed uh, 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 people and the next day they will be hungry again. And Ms. Jehu, what does rethinking global inequality mean to you after our event? Um, I agree with Dr. Zakla about the, the structural nature and necessity uh, of responding in, in a structural manner. So we need to be thinking and listening and talking and innovating uh, in order to respond adequately to inequality so that our responses are structural and they address the root causes 
um, and not just the symptoms. Of course, uh, as everyone has indicated, it is a very complicated um, uh, uh, situation and question. And if we had the answers, we would all share a Nobel Peace Prize or something like that. Um, but it is very complicated. Um, I think one of the other things that is also very clear is that um, we cannot, a, a, you know, policymakers, uh, people who are doing advocacy, governments, we cannot continue to offer up the same kinds of solutions that have not worked. The insanity of doing the same thing over and over and expecting different uh, results. And so solutions that are anchored in neoliberalism, the public-private partnerships, uh, the cost-sharing, all of those things, they've been around for decades. They haven't worked. Why do we keep uh, doing them? Why don't we think about different ones? And there are many alternatives, many tried on a, on a small scale, but maybe we need to scale up in terms of um, offering these um, uh, offering up these uh, alternatives. Uh, Dr. Zatler talked about local infrastructure. I remember being in Haiti and, and, and Haiti was receiving food aid. And what was happening was that uh, the food aid was for school feeding programs. And the farmers, the peasant farmers associations that we were meeting with, the movement, Papaye, Pabda and others, they were talking about how instead of the US aid doing aid, providing, bringing beans and potatoes from the US, why don't they buy from the peasant farmers cooperatives that had had those uh, food uh, uh, foods or, or those crops. So how do we do it differently? And I think, I, you know, last, lastly, and, and but perhaps not least, as, a, as an activist and as a feminist, I think for uh, everyone who is within, you know, uh, hearing and, and, and watching this, uh, that we need to be moving, building movements and joining movements that are fighting for justice. Uh, and they, they start at our local level, you know, the allusion to rising extremism, extremism and, and, and fascism. We need to be fighting it at the local level so that as they move up, um, you know, to local parliaments, to national parliaments, to regional European Union parliaments, to the African Union, whatever, that they are meeting um, resistance. Uh, we need to build those movements that are about upholding dignity, upholding values of feminism and equality, uh, not just as, as, as phrases, but as reality. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Jeu. I feel that we could continue this discussion for many, many hours, especially when it comes to concrete and practical measures to tackle uh, inequality, incoherence. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have time for that. But we do have time for uh, maybe two or three uh, questions from the audience. And for that, I would like to welcome Felix on the stage again, uh, who will now moderate the, the, the next question round. Hello again. Um, once again, I would like to begin with a question from the online audience. Um, actually, one remark first from the online audience. Someone, um, someone says that we continue to use the phrase developing countries on the stage, which um, is surprising because the 2030 agenda of the United Nations defines all countries as developing countries. So maybe just as a side note. Um, but one question that was raised online um, directed to Ms. Jehu, um, it actually takes up where you left. Uh, you yourself uh, mentioned that you are a feminist. Which concrete steps do you expect from the German Minister for Economic Cooperation and Development, who has proclaimed to introduce a new feminist approach to German development cooperation? So I think that one of the um, first things they, um, they need to do is to listen and listen better. Uh, Mr. Rue talked about decolonizing uh, development aid. Uh, and it is about how when people come at, at, to the table uh, together to, to discuss and to, um, and, and to address issues, how they deal with each other and how uh, people are treated and, 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 and what voices come to the table. So I think that, again, 
that old adage of doing the same thing and expecting different results. If you are doing a feminist policy, then there needs to be a very different look in terms of who is at that table. It is not the same ones that you know and that you have known always. Um, it is not um, about you know uh, uh, the same kinds of policies and approaches. So for the German um, uh, Ministry of International Cooperation or Development Cooperation, um, I think listening carefully, looking at where, because African feminists, for, for instance, have published volumes on what uh, feminist policies would look like. And I know that other even uh, organizations like Oxfam and Action Aid have also done the same. So maybe listening and learning from the ones who have been doing it for a long time, but practically even the aesthetic, the optics need to change. Right, then there's uh, another question for um, Mr. Arue from Nicole Kabel. She wants to know um, about concrete measures that could be taken in the global north to change structures that um, still um, foster inequality. Yeah, I, I try to refer to some of those um, in, in, in the work we did on analyzing uh, states' practices and whether they are coherent with the objective of uh, tackling inequalities, we identify different policy areas that require uh, action uh, from, the side, from, from the side of, uh, of uh, EU countries. Uh, so concrete measures, uh, that means, for example, um, aligning uh, lending practices with uh, the objective of not putting more burden on, on the global south in terms of the debts, for example. So we found in our report that uh, some countries still are lending money to countries that are already highly indebted, instead of actually using other measures like a concessional uh, support, which is uh, lending money but under uh, in better conditions than the ones you can find in the market for example so there are things that can be done uh, also debt reliefs we know that that something that also can can really help and we found very very little evidence of uh, of those and taking seriously the tax the tax debate uh, we are still countries that are doing tax dumping and and, and within the own the european union as such with uh, some countries having very very different levels of taxation on companies than others uh, so that if that has already very negative impacts within Europe, imagine apply to the global uh, to the global scale, or if continue, if Europe continues to be the refuge refuge for uh, for uh, for uh, money laundering, for example, as we found it's still the case according to some available international available uh, indexes and, and classifications, then that's also clearly concretely something that Europe should be revising, and, and we expect the role of the European Union in challenging so such such. Uh, Tax practices and financial secrecy uh, practices. So I already was mentioning mentioning before, uh, and also we need to have uh, to make sure we have uh, trading practices that are aligned with uh, human rights. Uh, I was mentioning before that uh, Germany is trading arms with 15 countries that are at, at, at conflict or at risk of conflict, uh, and that's the case for uh, 21 out of the 24 EU member states that we analyzed uh, in this regard. So that's also a concrete practice that can change with things that contribute to changing, changing things. I also mentioned earlier, and I will finish this, uh, support to domestic resource mobilization and technical support to, uh, to countries in the, in the global south. That's also concrete. That's also something achievable, and that's something that can be, can be done. So we don't have to look very far, actually, to find measures where we think we can make a difference and North can make a difference. It's actually political will, which is, which is missing. And that has been said before, inequality is a policy choice. Uh, it's about putting, you know, uh, before of or ahead of uh, policy coherence for the sustainable development. It's about putting other issues that are being put at the moment. Sometimes it's the argument about jobs, for example. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if uh, I suppose it's at some point about uh, making different objectives compatible or maybe sacrificing certain objectives if we think they are hindering the fight against inequalities. If we agree that that's a key priority for our governments uh, and achieving the agenda 20, 2030. So yeah, solutions, we know, we name them, we name them. And now it's about a political decision and someone being brave and implementing those decisions. We have already asked our panelists um, how they think about inequalities and the challenge of tackling inequalities after today's discussion. 
We would also like to ask you in the audience um, what you learned today, maybe something that surprised you. We have prepared a Slido. Maybe we can show this on the screen now. That would be great. So that uh, all of you here at HPS and also those joining us from their home um, can go to slido.com and enter the link, the, the code 9494, or you can scan the QR codes. And let us know what do you take home from this discussion with you? Maybe something that was new to you, something that surprised you, or something you find memorable. Or maybe something oh, or maybe something that you would have liked to delve deeper into for the next time. Perhaps while you all type away, are there any last burning questions in the audience present here today? I see no one jumping in their seats. That's all right, too. We can just wait for answers showing up here. And that's the first one. It's not just about spending money. It's about structural planning and implementing. Then someone says that local tax systems in relation to development assistance should be considered. The rich should be taxed. <laughs> I'm just picking the cherries now. It's about listening, for sure. I think we can agree that it's a structural issue. Thank you, whoever said that. OK, I believe um, while your thoughts and opinions keep popping up here, I can um, hand the word back to David, who will wrap up the discussion for today. Yes. So unfortunately, we are already at the end of our discussion. So uh, maybe let me sum up a little bit. Um, well, today, we talked about uh, global inequality uh, and its different dimensions. Uh, but we also talked about the role of the global north in sustaining global inequalities. Uh, it's historical responsibility to fight global inequality uh, redistribution as a measure to do so, and maybe also what uh, what is an obstacle uh, for redistribution, uh, just naming uh, um, incoherence again as a buzzword. Um, and we talked about other measures that uh, address global inequality using the example of COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, we learned, um, and I think I'm uh, going to close the wrap-up with those words, that addressing inequalities is a structural issue, uh, as a structural issue is a political choice, and how you address it matters. So in that light, I would like to uh, thank our guests for enriching our discussion um, and for sharing your views. And uh, of course, I would also like to thank the audience here in the room and online for your active uh, contribution. I know there was not enough time for asking questions, but yeah, maybe maybe next next time we will get better at that. Um, and before we close this event, I would like to inform you about our next uh, next event in the context of the uh, development policy discussion days. Uh, Tackling Two Crises at Once, Saving Climate Through Debt Relief, which will take place uh, tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, online from 3 p.m. till 5 p.m. Central European Summertime. Uh, you can still register for the event online uh, on the website of Heinrich Böll Foundation. And the second announcement I would like to make is um, there will be a briefing paper 
um, for this event, summarizing, but also um, deepening a little bit uh, the topics that have been discussed today. And this briefing paper will be published in June or July at the latest on the homepage of the Center for Rural Development. So that leaves me with uh, wishing you a nice evening and um, uh, thanks also to uh, Senya. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, get, get well home uh, safely.